Well, good morning, El Paso Bible Church. Glad to see you. We celebrate the Lord and His Word this morning. Uh, Steve said something that you might not have caught. He said we, we're going to take the Word seriously in a minute. Let me tell you something. There's not a minute of our day at El Paso Bible Church that we don't take the Word seriously. That's not what he meant, but I thought I'd give him a hard time. Every day from the day you walk in that door, the minute you walk in that door, the time you walk out, we're taking it seriously. We take it seriously every minute in between. Uh, but children, this is going to feel new. Did any of y'all have a weird night? I woke up at like 6.30 in a cold sweat because my schedule is so off. I had no idea. I thought I had missed church at 6.30 in the morning. But children, you guys can go to children's now. Remember, Explorers over here, even though the door, oh, the door says Explorers now. It says we switched it. Explorers over here. So older kids this way. And if you're in second grade or below, I think it is, you go with Miss Tina towards the back. And we're just doing that so that we can make sure that we have some reasonable expectation of distance in the rooms. Um, I don't know, you know, if, if it's about making Steve sing better, we need to give him a couple of masks. But um, if you want to wear yours, you wear yours. Uh, that's, then that's no problem. Uh, but we are trying. And we're going to have the kids use hand sanitizer in and out of the room and keep that distance. And that is um, within the guidelines that we have set before us as recommendations. Uh, not to manage. So we're going to continue on as we go. So go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of James. And, and I love James. I have taught James in Sunday school before, but it's been a number of years back, and it's one of my favorite books. Um, and always learn something new every time we open the Bible, by the way. Every time you, you devote yourself, there are a lot of things that you could spend your time doing. I used to work for a light bulb company years and years and years and years ago. Back then, I knew way more about light bulbs than any human being should ever know. Uh, but, and we had salesmen. Now, you don't think about light bulbs having salesmen, do you? But we had commercial salesmen, people that would go out and try to sell you the niftiest doodad light bulb that you could possibly do. Do you know how many times their sales calls actually even resulted in a meeting? Like, percentages of 1%, like a very small number. They had to work with a lot of rejection. They had to work with a lot of failure without lack of results, right? You don't have to worry about that with the Bible. You're not going to be a light bulb salesman. Every time you come to the Bible, you can walk away with something that is to your profit. And that's what we're doing here. We're learning how to walk wisely in the book of James. Uh, anybody? You need to learn a little more about how to walk wisely. Well, that's three people. That's, that's real good. Bunch of sinners. Man, I'll tell you. All right, we all need to learn to walk wisely. I'm going to impute to you the wisdom to know that you need to learn more today about how to walk wisely. Out of James chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 19. Now, you remember that uh, the previous section is, is really, he jumps right into that discussion. He starts with considering it all joy. He says we need to consider all these trials that we experience to be joy in our lives because of the product that God uses to produce in our lives by them. That we would have endurance and that endurance would have its perfect result that we would be fully supplied in our toolkit. Be able to face the things that we experience in our lives. And so unless you're at the point in your life where every day of every week and every minute of every day you know exactly what to do with every problem that you experience every difficulty you have, every interpersonal issue that you have, we still need this instruction. We need to continue to grow. We need to continue to let endurance have its perfect result. That means that we don't run away from trials, but that we rely on God in the midst of them. And if we can't agree with that, if we think, man, sometimes trials don't have meaning, sometimes trials don't have purpose, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. It's like throwing craps on the table, man. Just a roll of the dice, and we just get bad luck that's not wise. That's not wise. And that's not considering it all joy, by the way. And if we don't have that wisdom, at least, that's a, very, that's a very low baseline. That's a low bar for walking wisely. So if you lack wisdom, you can ask God for it. And he'll give it to you abundantly and without reproach. And you need to trust God. If you don't trust God on that one very baseline, minimal, simple promise, then you're going to be unstable, not only in your spiritual life, not only in the way you interrelate at church, but in all your ways, because you're going to try to live your life without believing anything. 
You know somebody like that? They're glorified on TV and in the movies. Actually, one of the pinnacles of all humorous movies out there, and I know many of you love this movie, Nacho Libre, right? They actually make fun of this guy, right? Esqueleto says, I don't believe in God. I believe in science. We glorify that. As if those two things are not able to be done simultaneously. But then we find out that the guy that says he believes in science thinks you can get eagle powers by eating an eagle egg. And that's about the size of it. Science doesn't have all those answers. You can't live your life. You'll be unstable in all of your ways if you can't believe God on this one promise to give you wisdom if you lack it. You won't be able to trust anybody or anything else in your life if you can't trust that. So we're going to do that. And then we talked about what it means to allow these things to take place in our lives and understand that our current circumstances are merely for future glory. They are not an end in and of themselves, whether we are poor, whether we are rich. The blessing, then, of persevering under trial is this crown of life that he gives to those who love him, loving Jesus, obeying him in the midst of trials, and not letting temptation result in sin in our lives so that we would die. He said, when sin, when sin, comes, to, sin comes to fruition in your life, it, you die. The wages of sin is death, by the way. We use that in, a, in a, a gospel presentation. That's not how Paul uses it. We used to say this a lot more frequently. We maybe need to say it again. Sin is bad for you. Why is it bad for you? Because it could kill you. And if you're dead, you aren't going to be persevering under trial. And if you're not persevering under trial, you don't get this crown of life. Because you're dead. Your heart's not pumping. Lungs aren't breathing. Brain's not firing. So don't be deceived. Good things come from God. So this you know, verse 19. We'll stop the review there. This you know. If you didn't know it before, you know it now. James just told you. This you know, my beloved brethren. But everyone, all of you, must be quick to hear, slow to speak, (laughs) I know the irony of a pastor reading this verse, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Everyone, quick to hear. You You should run Where's the opportunity to listen, to hear? You should make haste towards it. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. He has a reason for that. Very next verse, verse 20 says, For the the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, notice there's no qualifications to that statement. You may have a very good reason for being angry. You may have a temper problem, but we're not going to discuss that. You may have a very good reason for being angry. I don't care. (laughs) Neither does James. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Was he saying, well, the goal of your, of your, the goal of this instruction here is to spend less time angry. Now, people tell me sometimes the Bible isn't relevant to our day. Have you watched the news lately? You're watching what we call the outrage culture. You know what another word for outrage is? Anger. Outrage is like big bad anger. You're watching it. So do you know what you're watching? Hosts and hosts and hosts of protesters, rioters, if you can tell the difference, not achieving the righteousness of God. That's what we call it. 
We call it the rage culture, the outrage culture, the deeply angry culture. James says, cut that out. Because the righteousness of God is not achieved that way. Ever. Can you get the government to do something? Maybe. Isn't that scary? I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That scares a fool out of me. And I got a lot of fool to scare. The goal is to spend less time angry in your life because the, ang- the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. In any given set of circumstances, you and I, whether we know it or not, and this is the hard part, you don't always know how the righteousness of God is going to get applied in any given situation. You don't always know that. That's why I tell people, if you're going to pray imprecatory psalms, you better put your mouth guard in because you're going to be praying that God break the teeth of the wicked. Just be careful with that, huh? David's not talking about position there. He's talking about behavior. (laughs) About his enemies that are doing bad things to him. You don't know. But what we do know is that we want the righteousness of God applied. Yes? We can agree with that theoretically, even though you may actually not like how the righteousness of God works out in any given circumstance. We know at least hypothetically, theoretically, that we desire God's righteousness to be applied in any given set of circumstances. We want God's righteousness now. And we may not know what it looks like, but we know that our anger doesn't achieve that. We have a saying, and I use it a lot, probably too much. You can't t- I, For whatever reason, I can't remember musical notes on a page that saved my life. But little one-liner quips from people in history, I have a massive mental catalog. I don't know why. Of all the gifts, right? We have a saying that I apply most often to government, and if you can't be a part of the solution, there's good money to be made in being part of the problem. Any better description of Congress? Any legislature out there at all? If you can't be a part of the solution, there's good money to be made in being part of the problem. That's not the way God's economy works, by the way. We can describe a lot of humanity that way. There's some truth to that in our daily lives and in our system, but that's not the way that God's system works. Anger has the capacity to make us a part of the problem, but not to provide any profit at all. It does not achieve the righteousness of God. And God's economy, being angry, doesn't do that. And that's the one that matters. That's the one that I want. I mean, you could even say it that way. I mean, the outrage of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So James says, in order to spend less time angry and not achieving the righteousness of God, this is is the cocktail, this is the wisdom cocktail for this section. And in fact, it becomes the outline for the book. This you know, brethren, but let every man do this. Or every one, actually, it's every anthropos. That means, ladies, you got to do this too. All the 31 and a half other genders I'm not sure about. But men and women, I know what Antipas refers to. I'm just kidding. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Therefore, he said, so this is the outline for the book. So what's he going to start with? Being quick to hear. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, And all that remains of wickedness in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. What? What does that mean? You might be saying, how is that relevant there? What is that about quick to hear what? What he's saying is that you, you, in order for you to rush to hear the things you need to hear, you need to start with a very basic commitment, and that is to not let this filthiness and stuff that is part of our lives stand in the way. Put it aside. Put it aside. Put that wickedness aside. In humility. 
recognizing that you had to rid yourself of something in order to put yourself in this position in humility. You don't know everything. You haven't done everything right. Take a position of humility and welcome the Word. Welcome the Word, he says, that was implanted or planted in you. Now remember, not one, not one single word, not one single word of the book of James is written to a lost person. Why? How do I know that? From phrases like that. Well, aside from beloved brethren, 27 times in the book of James. Does a lost person have the word implanted? No. What he's saying is believers, don't you dare get tired of hearing the word of God. Any time that you can hear the word of God, you ought to be quick to do so. You ought to be enthusiastic to welcome it into your life. It was planted. Now you need to welcome the cultivation of the word in your life. I'll be honest, I've made some part of my living cultivating the word of God in other people for about 17 years now. Not always full time. A lot of weird ways that God has provided opportunity for me to do that. And sometimes I have a hard time with that. Pastors call it Black Monday. You know, we say that there's, there's three sermons for every sermon you preach. There's the one you prepare to preach, there's the one you preach, and on Monday there's the one you wish you preached. When you're in the throes of that, let me tell you something, somebody slaps a Bible verse on you, you're like, get out of my face. They may be trying to be encouraging. It may be the right verse. You know whose problem that is? Mine. If somebody gives me an appropriate, applicable Bible verse, and I tell, my mental reaction is, get that out of my face, Skippy. That's my fault. Now, I'm not going to say that you all do that, but you ought to, you know, engage in a slight moment of introspection and wonder. Ask yourself if you welcome the Word of God on a regular basis. You can get donuts anywhere, right? We had donuts today. That was good. Coffee. Coffee is the more important part for me. Welcome it. So why should you do that? Why should you do that? Well, it's, it's walking wisely. Everything that James tells us in this book is about how, as a believer in Jesus Christ, who has the perfect, absolute, irrevocable possession of eternal life, can take that eternal life and live it to the day his heart stops beating wisely until he goes to be with Jesus. All of it is. What is this? Why is this wise? It says this, which is able to save your suke. I left it in Greek for a reason because your translation most likely says soul. Right? And what do you think of when, when you think of soul? Well, you, you're an American, so you think of Sylvester the cat with a harp floating immaterially on a cloud up to heaven, watching Tweety Bird continue to live. Or, yeah. Yes? I mean, like you think of it as being an immaterial thing. But let me explain to you, if, if you have read any nautical history, this is where I think of this coming up, right? And a ship goes down, and a fellow officer, a fellow ship, is now writing the account of the sinking of the ship, and he says there were 172 souls aboard. Does he mean that only, the only things that went down in the ocean were the immaterial parts that were playing the harp going up to heaven with the Tweety Bird? I mean, with, the, with the, the cat, right? No. He means the whole person. They all went down. Material and immaterial went down into the deep. So that's, that's a perfectly good way we use the word soul. But a lot of times we don't think about it that way. But that's the normal way that suke is used in the New Testament even. 
when James is saying this, he says, you, you need to welcome the word implanted. You need to receive it. Anytime you get opportunity, you need to be quick to hear it and take it into account in your life and apply it. Why? Because it keeps you from dying. This is the other side of that coin, right? When sin gives birth, when lust gives birth, then sin, sin leads to death. Your heart stops pumping. Your lungs stop breathing. Your synapses stop firing. And James is saying this, that it is critical for your life as a believer in this, in this world, living your life until you go to be with Jesus to walk wisely, that you receive this word regularly. And welcome it. Be quick to hear it. Because it'll give you length of days. It doesn't allow, if you walk wisely in this way, your life is going to be not cut short. When sin is accomplished, James says it brings forth death. It kills us, but when we welcome the word, it's able to save our lives. Not least of all, because in preparation for this, right, we have to put aside all filthiness and wickedness, which is the stuff that shortens it. It says in James, walking wisely means welcoming the word. Welping, welcoming the word saves our lives. It gives us the opportunity to be blessed in many other ways, specifically the one that he just mentioned, which was the ability to persevere under trial and to receive the blessing that comes with that, that crown of life. This will be quick to hear. Welcome the word. Verse 22 says this. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So be quick to hear. Also, prove yourselves doers and not merely hearers who have deluded themselves. That's the point of hearing, by the way. The point of hearing is, is the doing. Now, we don't, we don't break our sermons down like this. A lot of people do, which is that we're not done here unless I tell you what to do exactly with your first step out of the foyer. We're not normally going to make that kind of application, right? We don't do that. We, we trust the Holy Spirit in you to take the word that is preached to you, that you are welcoming so that you can walk wisely and you can make the application yourself. Maybe I'm a fool for doing that, but I believe that that's what Scripture indicates that we ought to do with somebody who stands on the same two feet that I stand on, walking by the Spirit before the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to tell you where to spend your grocery dollars or where not to buy your gas or all the other junk that gets spewed out of here as a proper biblical application. I'm not going to do that. But, James says, there are additional blessings here if you're a doer of the Word. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers. So if you take in the word and you welcome the word and you don't apply it to your life, he's saying that, that you, have, you have told yourself a lie. You have told yourself a lie that you can get the same benefit by just hearing the word as other people get by doing it, and that doesn't work. There's one way to this blessing. So here's a description. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer... He is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgot what kind of person he was. Now, I used to kind of wonder what that meant when I was in high school. Because, you know, like, we're all pretty in high school. At least when we look back from our age now, we look back at our high school, but pretty good looking. Have you driven by a high school lately? No, you're lying if you tell me you haven't done this. You drive by the high school, did they even look in a mirror? <laughs> what is going on? If they looked in a the mirror, they turned away and they forgot what they looked like because Jesus loves you, but holy smokes, you've made some poor decisions. look in the mirror, the whole point of looking in the mirror is to remember what you look like. 
He says, if you're, if you're hearing the word and you're not doing the word, the word is telling you this is what you ought to do because this is who you are. This is what you, why you're doing it. You're supposed to be blessed because you persevere under trial with this life and you're not supposed to succumb to temptation. Least of all, are you supposed to blame God for the temptation in your life? But you're supposed to consider it all joy and let endurance have its perfect result that you'll be complete and perfect and lacking in nothing. But if you just read the Bible or you just come to church, you finish up your donut and you manage to keep your eyes open in church afterwards, and you don't adversely react to hearing the word, you're not getting all the blessing that's supposed to come by it. God has more. Prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law. He doesn't allow you, by the way, to make a mistake there. To tell you that it's a law about do's and don'ts, and thou shalt and thou shalt not. One who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it. The law of liberty. Freedom in Christ. Is the way that I understand it. Law of liberty. That's my identity in Christ. We, we talked a lot about abiding in Christ out of the Gospel of John because, you know what? Jesus talked a lot about it in the Gospel of John to his disciples. But here James talk, uses a similar word. He says that if you look intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and you abide by it, in other words, if I understand what that law says that I am and what I should do, and I do those things, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. And by the way, this is where effectual belongs. <laughs> People think effectual in other, front of other words that the Bible never does. He's saying you, if you do this, if you gaze at this law of liberty, which is contained in the word of God, and you allow it to inform who you are and what you should do, and you gaze at it, you're no longer forgetful, but you are an effectual doer. You know the difference, right? between an effectual doer and an ineffectual doer? The, the effect, he actually makes progress. He does something. You can be busy your whole life, right? Everyone, anyone not busy? This is America. That's like our national pastime, complaining about how busy we are and how little time we have. You and I have the same amount of time. We literally have the same amount of minutes today as everyone else. Am I wrong? Have I entered a breach in the space-time continuum where I actually have less minutes than you do? Because sometimes it feels like that, but I have to remind myself. I have the same minutes you do. You have the same minutes I do. And today I could choose to gaze into the law of liberty, into God's word, and find out what, what it says that I am, because sometimes I need that reminder. Sometimes I need the reminder of who I am in Jesus Christ and what I have been called to do. I need to remind myself of that. Because sometimes I start blaming my genealogy. Do you do that sometimes? Like two generations ago, everybody was a sharecropper in my, in my family. Like an actual sharecropper. I'm not using that derogatorily. One of them sharecropped with mules. One of them used a tractor. That was the only difference. None of them were stellar people. A lot of suicide, a lot of abuse, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of substance abuse, a lot of terrible things done to their family members over and over and over and over and over. And if I fail to gaze into the law of liberty and God's word to let it inform me who I am in Christ and what it says I should do, then the natural alternative is to let what the last three and four generations did to each other define those things for me. I have a preference there. 
I hope you have a purpose. Because if I let those things define who I am minute by minute, then I waste those minutes. I waste them. And I may not live the life that Christ has for me. And he says the benefit. See, because a lot of people say this. They use James 1, 20 and 21 here. And I did this. I have a little plaque when I graduated from high school. And I was so happy that I graduated from high school. I always felt like I was not going to graduate from high school because I was in a class of 10 people and half of us were National Merit Scholars and I always felt like the dumb one. I did! I was not the valedictorian, I was not the salutatorian, but I was three people away, so, like, I'm not a dummy, right? I always felt like that. But people take this the wrong way. I had it on my plaque, and they tell you that, that if you are a hearer of the word, because I think James is talking to unbelievers. This is the kind of very basic mistake. James says, brethren, 27 times. I have no reason to doubt that he's, he, he can't, he's not actually talking to his brothers. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the brethren, and he says, brethren, be doers and not merely hearers to delude, who delude themselves. You know, a lot of believers delude themselves by imputing behavior and doing to the things that they know and not actually doing them, giving themselves credit where credit is not due. But James, does, James actually defines this for He doesn't allow us to relate this to justification. He doesn't allow, it, allow us to relate it to going to heaven when we die. He doesn't change the audience to an unbeliever. He says why we should do this. This is very basic. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. This man will be blessed in what he does. Now, what would that mean normally? We've got some business owners here. I myself own a couple. What does it mean to be blessed in what you do? Business owners, give me, a, give me some help here. What does it mean for you to be blessed in what you do? Kevin, you sell a lot of steaks at a decent price, right? Okay. Kevin would be happy for selling the beef at something of a break-even point. Okay, but he's going to be blessed in what he does. Why? Because you're walking wisely. You're receiving the word that is implanted. You are applying it to your life. You are walking wisely. You are having faith in God. You are considering it all joy, understanding that trials have a function in your life, regardless of the success that you experience. But if you walk wisely with the Lord, gazing intently at God's word, then you're going to be blessed in what you do. Now, that doesn't always mean your balance sheet is going to be exactly where you want it. But you're going to be in a trust position with God and understand that he is working great things in your life and you are blessed in what you do because you're walking wisely and you're an effectual doer. And one of the sad dynamics in church is that men the age of my sons, and I consider them all men because for thousands of years, except for the littlest one, he's not quite there. But the four older boys are men because for thousands of years they could go and fight and die for their country. We don't let them do it quite yet now. At the age of 14, there's been plenty of people that were full-fledged soldiers. They're men, right? And here's what the sad dynamic is with young men that age frequently. And I'm not going to tell you any stories about where they are now. Or I'm just using them as an example of their age, their generation, their position in life. Is that what we find is that people go out and seek the blessing for what they're doing. They go out and seek success in their endeavors, looking for being blessed in what they do. And then decades later, they come back to the church to welcome the Word of God at that point. I don't see that as an option. Young men, you guys, younger men, even older men who have uh, things going on. You want to get blessed in what you're doing? 
It's all part of the package. You've got to welcome the Word of God. Don't be just a hearer of the Word of God, but a doer. And abide by it. Work by its definition of who you are in Jesus Christ and do what it says to do. And I can't guarantee you your success rate. I can guarantee that no matter how much you succeed, the IRS will take its pound of flesh, right? Or more, a few pounds. I could stand a few pounds of flesh. can't guarantee that, but I guarantee you'll be blessed in what you do. If you're an effectual doer, walking wisely in this life. I want it today. I want it tomorrow. And I'll tell you, I've tried to take some shortcuts to that in my, my life. I, some of the advice I received after I graduated from seminary was go make your money. Go make your money. If you go make a, a bunch of money, then you can do what you want. In other words, you, then you can go be a pastor. Weird advice. It was well-intentioned. Well-intentioned uh, from the person that gave it to me. Actually, it was more than one person that gave it to me. Go, go make your money. Let me tell you something. I tried that. Didn't work. Y'all know I'm not a dummy. Y'all know I work, right? People that don't work don't dress like me. And people that don't work don't have three crooked fingers on their left hand. Normally. It wasn't a matter of me not being smart enough. It was not a matter of me not working hard enough. It was a matter of doing the wrong thing. The wrong way. For the wrong reason. At that time in my life. Not being an effectual doer. Welcome the word. Abide by it. Do it and be blessed in what you do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. We thank you for the practicality of James. Father, we, we know how beautiful this book is when understood well. We, we know, Father, that so many have used it to instill fear and insecurity in people. But Father, we know that it gives us assurance of your plan and your work in our lives. And we love you and we thank you for it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you'll open your hymnals once again to number 179, we're going to...